Okay. Um, hello. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, apologies for the slight technical mishap there. Um, I'm Andrew. Um, this is my colleague Anthony. Hello. Um, we're going to talk about uh, applications for virtual fit fashion. So first of all, um, to give you a little bit of an overview uh, of body scanning technology, uh, the technologies that we've worked with. Uh, use infrared depth sensors, so similar to what you'd find in uh, a Microsoft Connect. Um, operates in the size of a, a changing cubicle. Uh, it takes um, multiple scans from multiple different sensors um, of, of the subject. Uh, the whole process takes less than 10 seconds to run, um, and the output from that is point cloud data, um, which is essentially uh, a number of um, three-dimensional coordinate points. Um, along with that, uh, the software that ships with the scanners um, gives a list of body dimensions, body measurements, um, and in sort of fashion, app fashion applications, um, this is used for body shape analysis, um, clothing size standards, research, uh, product development, and things related to that. Um, with the software uh, also that produces the measurements. Uh, it uses these measurements um, to reproportionalize uh, a pre-made avatar, uh, again, that's used. The accuracy of the representation, uh, you can see above using two different scanners. Uh, so one being the side screen, uh, one being the TC2. Uh, and you can see uh, the right-hand side representation is um, a solid representation of the point cloud data. Um, the figure to the left you'll see is the, the representative avatar. Uh, and what you will see um, that with the, the reproportionalization uh, and the application to the avatar, whilst the body measurement points are, are accurate, um, the, the overall um, shape of the figure is not necessarily a, a true representation as, as the point cloud data is. Um, the problem with the point cloud data uh, is it's quite noisy. When we're looking at animating um, a, an avatar, uh, one important consideration is the topology of the 3D model. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side there, the the physical representation of the point cloud data, you, you can see that noise uh, in terms of its topology. Um, so when I talk about topology, um, we're talking about the anatomy uh, of what makes the 3D model um, and the different points. Uh, and this is really important when we come to further animate that model, um, as that topology uh, defines the, the deformation points. So when we hard surface modeling, um, it's, it's a very different workflow to modeling for an organic deformable mesh. Um, so as you can see, the, the reconstruction of the point cloud data is, is noisy, which makes it quite unusable um, for animation. What we have there um, is, is the shaded view of it with, without the topology lines on. Um, and something that's been integrated with um, 3D modeling applications is, is a retopology mechanism uh, and tool set. So the model that you can see on the right hand side is a retopologized version of the point cloud data. Um, and the difference between that and what you've seen in the previous slide uh, with the, the reproportionalized avatars is you get a much truer representation of that point cloud data, the, the actual scan uh, of the subject. So being able to retopologize and, and define where those um, lines of deformation are going to be makes for a much more usable mesh for animation. In terms of texturing, what we've seen so far is a sort of gray, untextured model. Um, what we're able to do is, is texture uh, a 3D model. And the workflow with that involves breaking up and, uh, and unfolding the, the 3D model onto a two-dimensional coordinate space, which you can see down here on the left-hand corner. And applied to the 3D model, you can see that it enables us to take a, a 2D image uh, and apply that 
to the 3D model. So what you can see there is, is a painted texture um, using uh, digital paint packages um, in order to, to colorize the texture and apply that to the 3D model. Um, developments of that, uh, we could use um, photographs of, of the subject uh, and apply that image-based data uh, of a subject onto the 3D representation, enabling a, a much more uh, realistic and true representation of the subject that's been scanned. In terms of cloth texturing uh, and developing a, a 3D cloth model uh, and simulation, uh, we can use that same process. So we can model uh, a dress around a subject, um, or we can take um, an image of, of a, a flat textile that, that can be made into a 3D model, uh, and we can apply and we can texture that, uh, and we can clothe the 3D model in, in a cloth. In terms of then animating that, um, we need to be able to develop physically accurate uh, representations of, of how that cloth would behave. Um, so thinking in terms of different textile properties, how they react to, to their environment, and, and how that cloth would appear um, in terms of virtual fit fashion. Um, we can look at uh, a couple of videos of the output of that, if we can get that up. So the video that you see there, uh, we've taken the 3D model uh, of, of a garment uh, and applied uh, a light breeze to that. So you can see how the, the cloth would simulate under various conditions uh, and, and different textile properties, how they would react in an environment. If we then apply that and overlay it to the avatar of the subject in terms of virtual fit fashion, we can have a look at that. I think. OK, so what we have here uh, is, is a rendered output using the, the textured model, uh, the textured representation of, of the scanned subject, uh, and overlaid that with a cloth simulation. Uh, and this enables us to, to view what that garment would look like on the individual under various lighting conditions, uh, using different garment properties. Um, so it, it, it opens up the virtual fit fashion um, experience. Uh, and my colleague Anton is going to now talk about um, no, not quite. Or is going to later to talk about sorry the, the different technologies involved in, in the application of that directly. Um, so in terms of the cloth simulation, uh, we've seen that. Uh, we've seen it applied to a, a static avatar um, that's not been animated. What we would like to be able to do is, is combine that with motion capture technologies to be able to animate the avatar as well as the cloth simulation. So there's many different technologies um, for motion capture. Um, there's the, the Kinect systems, there's sensor-based systems, there's optical camera-based systems, all with the different um, pros and cons. Um, so what many of, of the technologies do allow for is, is real-time visualization, uh, as you can see on the image there. It allows us you, you to view in real time uh, the output from the, the motion capture data. Um, this we can store in data files, save for a later application. Um, so in terms of personalizing an avatar, uh, as well as getting the, the body dimensions and the shape and the texture in, we can also record a subject's motion, um, store that, and, and apply it to, to an animated avatar. So enable us to really personalize that, that animation and, and, and that subject. Uh, apply to a cloth simulation, you can then see what a subject would look like in a particular garment um, for the application of, of virtual fit fashion and, and visualization. Um, so it opens up the um, avenue for animated fashion shows, enabling clients to reach um, a global audience uh, and opening up the possibilities for, for virtual reality experience, which Ant is now going to talk about. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. So, hello, I'm the other speaker. My name's Anthony. Um, 
so where does what Andrew is talking about all fit with regards virtual fit technology? Um, I'm, I'm going to briefly sort of go through the state of play as it is currently with the virtual fit technology, talk about the successes, talk about its current limitations um, and what problems that poses, um, as well as the possibilities and uh, how we sort of see this will evolve over the coming years, over the next sort of five to ten years or so for the future of what could potentially be um, real sort of virtual fit experiences. So, sort of looking at uh, virtual fit as it exists currently, um, there's a lot of different options out there. This is just a sort of a small sample of, of what exists currently on the web. Um, the first thing you'll notice is none of them necessarily take information um, from body scan data that's retopologized with proper cloth developed to place on top, like Andrew was just talking about, which would be the ideal solution. In, in, in an ideal world, we'd be able to do that, but none of these really do. Um, it's a great step from what was possible a few years ago, um, all these web um, integrations and app-based integrations, mobile integrations are great, um, but what we'd really like to be able to do is uh, provide more of a, 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 more of a personalized, more in-depth, more technical experience, but for the ease of use of the user. Um, and I said we've come a long way uh, with, with regards uh, the original idea behind virtual fit fashion. Um, and the, the, you know, this idea isn't new at all. Uh, going back 15 years, the exact same idea existed, um, but you know, incredibly limited by technology. Technology moves along in leaps and bounds, and what we're talking about here is CPU power and GPU power in particular. Um, so we can do wonderful virtual fit fashion given you know, a week's notice and a body scan and all this information, and we can make something that looks essentially real, given enough computing power, um, but you need a week to do it. What we need is to be able to do that in real time and for someone to be able to interact with those clothes in real time and see how they would actually fit. Um, but unfortunately, we're still limited by technology. So I said that the idea has been around a long time. This is a very old implementation um, from around 2000, 2001 in a bit of software called CME. Um, which essentially, it's the same idea we're still trying to achieve now. It's this idea of you, you put in some approximate measurements, um, drag and drop some clothes over the top, and there you go. You, you're good to go. And what it was was a very, at the time, quite good, but now very poorly rendered set of JPEGs that you simply clicked through that were automatically generated, and you, know, you were away. It's, it's quite a poor implementation, but it was semi-revolutionary for the time. It looks horrendous, but... Um, you know, we are, we are going back 15 years. But the point is, we were limited by technology then, and we're still limited now. Um, while all the implementations are good that exist currently, um, they exist in the format they do because there's not enough computing power still to be able to do what we'd like to do. So if, if you look at these again, um, and I just sort of highlight some of the technologies they use. So primarily, a lot of these will use WebGL technologies, um, and there's only one that really takes a sort of a very basic 3D avatar, which is this, this low one at the bottom here. Um, but there are a couple of very, very good ideas and very, very clever bits of software in here as well. So if you look at the one at the bottom right, for example, um, this uses a Kinect sensor, which is a, a, a depth camera. Um, so far bottom right, we have, um, and this is sort of showpiece type technologies. So the person goes into the store, um, they stand in front of the, TV screen, the Kinect picks them up, it creates a very coarse, rudimentary 3D geometry, they drag and drop using gestures, which clothes they want to try on, and move around, and what, what they get is a reasonably poor look of the clothes they're wearing appear on the screen. The idea is very good, but unfortunately we can't simulate the movement of cloth fast enough at high enough resolution in order for that to work. And the computer has to be able to read in the data based on the person's motion, which it can't do at a high enough rate in order to be able to interpret the information, pass it to the cloth simulation, and then display it in real time on the screen. Very, very difficult to do. Um, another very clever bit of, uh, of work that's been done is with this uh, mirror, which is very similar technology to the Connect implementation, uh, but its focus is more on being able to alter in real time the patterns and the colors in a mirror environment. Um, now, it might be 
um, in, with the way things are currently going, with every single normal thing in your house becoming smart, inverted commas, it might be that the eventual solution is a smart mirror that in 15 years' time, and I do mean 15 years at least, it, 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 this won't be a 10-year thing, the eventual solution may be a smart mirror whereby information is fed through to your home from retailers and you, you, you do the whole gesture thing and you see it on. Very sort of minority report, sci-fi type, futuristic vision for things, but that, that is a long way away. That may be the end output, um, but what we're interested in is what technology we can use now in order to you know, potentially shape this space. Um, so what about new tech? Uh, the current implementations, are, are, they, they have the drive to improve the service, um, reduce return rates, um, essentially by just by putting in approximate measurements, people will get a reasonable idea, uh, and provide a bit of wow factor for the store, the brand in question, things like that. Um, but, that but that's their aim, especially the in-store implementations. It's, it's for the wow factor. It's for, this is a very expensive piece of kit, and isn't it wonderful, and that sort of thing. Um, it's kind of a halfway house between online and in-store shopping. Um, but what if we could take technology from a different industry that's been developed over a long period of time that has an awful lot of characteristics that we can use that already exist in order to enhance the experience that we're after for this sort of work? Um, and that, in particular, is, is the gaming industry. So it's, it's, this is the perfect place to be talking about this, and I hope everyone isn't VR'd out at this point. But what if VR were to take off? Now, I'm not saying it will. I actually don't think it will this generation. Um, there was a wonderful talk earlier. I don't know if anyone sat here saw it. Um, I missed her last name, unfortunately, but it was an entrepreneur by the name of Anna. And she was talking about uh, VR implementations um, for, you know, 360 views inside stores, and you can pick on items and, and all this sort of thing. Not virtual fit, but she also said um, that she was a bit hesitant of virtual fit, and I don't blame her, purely because of what I've just talked about, it's not there yet. But what if high-end VR ended up becoming the norm? So there's an awful lot of talks going on elsewhere here, talking about content creation. There, there was a lot yesterday, talking about VR content creation and how we generate that content and how we make that content accessible in order for it to appeal to the mass market. And that's, that's the key thing. Uh, and the second key thing is while there may be a lot of the inverted commas cheap VR headsets that are due to be sold, so there's, there's a forecast that 200 million of them are due to be sold by 2020, in reality, a lot of those will be the low power end. They will be the mobile phone headsets. And we still can't do, even though it's come on leaps and bounds since in terms of power over the last five years, we still won't be able to do it without. What we need is high end PCs. And for that to take off, we need high end VR to take off, which requires media content creators to get behind it in a big way. So I don't think it will this generation. We're talking five, 10, 15 years down the line. But in a future generation, the next, the next set of Oculus is the next set of OSDRs, the next set of HTC Vives. That's when it will probably gain a foothold. Um, because it's not quite ready yet, the power is not quite there. Um, a good analogy to use is the difference between the PDA and the smartphone. PDA had, a, had all the right ideas, it was everything you could do with a smartphone, but the technology wasn't there yet, it wasn't quite powerful enough in order to be able to do it until we could get a smartphone to work and it worked brilliantly and then it took off. And unfortunately, the PDA got completely left behind and left some companies with it. But that, 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 that's a bit of history. But um, you know, so a couple of generations of time, this is what we can use. And what if in real time, 30 frames a second, we could have a store presence, um, you know, a virtual environment that looked, had the fidelity of something like that, which looks pretty good. And that is actually, it's, it's a year old um, from an artist called Benoit, uh, who's a very good Unreal artist, 3D artist, and that runs in real time at you know, 60 frames a second. This is the kind of fidelity we can get now in a VR headset. So if we can create a store looking like that, and we can move around it looking like that, and we have headsets proliferating into households, and it is a big if, it, it does require um, a particular set of the market to have these headsets within their household so that the particular demographic that would be interested in this sort of work and then this sort of thing in terms of the VR experience and virtual fit. Um, it needs to be in their households in order for this to work. But we can get this level of fidelity now in a VR headset, rather than the current web implementations of web VR. 
So, to be honest, it, it's kind of not, a, it, it, in my opinion this is of course, but it's, it's not kind of a question of if or how, but when this will happen. Because we have the power, it will happen. Um, leaps and bounds are happening all the time, especially in terms of GPU power. We're not very far away um, in terms of getting exceptionally high quality real-time cloth simulation, which is kind of the, the, the crux of where this sits. It's the apex of whether this will work or not. Um, as I say, cloth simulation is, is, is the most difficult thing here. We need it running in real time at a very high resolution. It can run very well in real time at a reasonable resolution um, that works from far away camera shots. But when you're looking at how you want garments to sit um, on what is essentially your body, if we're talking about body measurements, um, it needs to be exceptional. It needs to be what currently takes a few days to simulate or a few hours to simulate it. But it needs to run in real time at least 30 frames a second. Um, and the other problem is when we talk about avatars, especially in the virtual reality space, is the problem known as Uncanny Valley, um, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with. But it's this idea of if something's not quite right in a virtual space, but you're aware that it's uh, virtual, you're aware that it's not real, it can cause a sense of repulsion. And that's not something that you want your users hitting if you're wanting them to buy clothes, you're wanting them to enjoy the experience, you do not want this sense of repulsion. So it's this question of what do you do? Do you hit the, you know, do you make this perfect avatar? And it would have to be perfect. The person would have to be n unable to tell if it's them or not, which is nigh on impossible to achieve completely. Um, or do you go for, you know, this, this generic avatar or nothing at all? Do you completely remove the 3D mesh and just focus on how the clothes would fit on a person's body? Which, is, which would be easy to do, but that's the kind of complication we're looking at with this sort of thing. Um, but there are potentially huge advantages. It could be a very close replication of, of the shopping experience if we wanted it to be, with a very quick, very easy update process. So someone can create an entire store in 10 years' time, and they can change the entire layout of it from one day to the next. And you can have direct contact with your consumer, telling them the store's updated, new clothes, now you can get there at any time of day. It's always open. There's no, there's no problem getting there. And because of gaming technology, the net code is already there and available to allow us to, you could actually get, you, know, you can do, you can have the whole experience with other people there at the same time. You can choose to shop with other people or without other people. You could have the shop empty if you wanted to. You could see everyone else that was there if you wanted to. Um, and there's also the added advantage with, with this sort of work with regards to people that may want to experience this sort of thing but can't because, because they may struggle with disabilities or struggle with mental health issues. You know, if they have so social anxiety, for example, people may not want to go into stores. People may not like even leaving the house if you're talking about agoraphobics, things like that. So there are, there's potential advantages for that sort of thing as well. Um, and there's potential higher spend. Uh, been ex gaming's been experimenting with this for a few years with regards to uh, introducing monetization. Um, and, and you can get people to spend higher amounts of money, as it were, with sort of non-tangible things. Now, you'll be able to miss the touch and the feel of it. That's, that's what we can't quite achieve yet, but um, it, that would have to come if we created it and we tested it and we'd have to see over many years what exactly happened in terms of spend expenditure. Um, but it'd be, it'd be very interesting, like I say, as technology develops, this is the sort of area we can push into, which would be very fun and very entertaining. Um, but yes, no, I think that's good. Thank you very much. Um, if there's any questions, I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah I think we've uh, yeah, a few minutes for questions. If uh, anybody's got any questions on any of that or any ideas. Yeah? Second. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was looking for the loudspeakers, thank you. <laughs> what are you doing exactly with the Connect tool? You measure the people and... Uh, we're, sorry, am I on? Um, we're, we're, we're actually not using Connect. We, we have some work going on in our department with the Connect. That's not our work with, with the Connect on there. That's, that's pre existing work that someone else has implemented. Um, but it, it's a depth sensor and it generates a, a very coarse 3D model over the top of the person. They can drag clothes on top of themselves and move around in real time. It doesn't work perfectly, but that's kind of how it works. It's a depth sensing camera that creates a 3D model of the person. What we do we use? Um, very, very similar to the Connect, what I was talking about with the, the, the body scanner system. It uses that, that depth sensing um, to, to scan the subject. It, it outputs the point cloud data, the 3D coordinate points that, that make up that point cloud data. So whilst it's not motion capture and interacting directly in front of a, a Connect, it uses the same technology to take 
um, a representation of the subject, yeah. Anybody else? No? The well, then, thank you very much, guys. And now we're going to have a little break, 15 minutes, and afterwards we're going to continue with the future of e-commerce. <laughs>